Welcome to the third part of the Vintage Motherboard Hole series. In today's video, a bit KN8 SLI, socket 939 SLI motherboard. So, welcome again to the third part in the series. We're going to look at our gorgeous a bit KN8 SLI motherboard here. This is actually one of the motherboards that I'm reasonably excited about because uh, I never really owned a 939 motherboard that was this advanced. I've had a couple of others, in fact I still do, but most of them are via chipsets with uh, AGP. And this is definitely one from late in the series. We can see we're moving on to PCI Express. We have one, two, three, four, five slots of PCI Express, not only two of the parallel variety of uh, PCI there. And uh, yeah, but we still have all of the legacy I.O. that we would expect from a motherboard of this age. So we're now very firmly into the Windows XP era with this board. With the previous boards were all Windows 98 uh, era. This is definitely a bit newer than that. So uh, yeah, let's take a look at the board here. As we can see we have a full ATX layout. We have four memory slots. This motherboard is capable of dual channel DDR1 memory up to 400 megahertz natively which is 200 megahertz per front of mega transfers, but eh, whatever. Uh, there's probably overclockable kits uh, that go a bit faster, like DDR500. I don't have any on hand to test, but, you know, it's an overclocking motherboard, so it's uh, it's uh, out there. It's an option. We have a nice uh, heat sink and vapor chamber combination here to cool the VRM and the North Bridge. The North Bridge is part of the NVIDIA Enforce 4 SLI chipset that this motherboard is equipped with, which is very nice. We're actually going to take a look at that SLI bit uh, in a future video, if this board works. So that's that's a big if. Uh, we can see a special card here. In fact, let me pull it out so we can take a look at it. It is the Abit Shadow card. This is a special Terminator card that you slot into the secondary X16 slot on an SLI motherboard like this. And what that does is, it will make sure that this slot keeps running at 16x speed. When you take this card out, both of these slots will both operate at the same time and they will split the lanes between them. So this will be 8x and this will be 8x as well. These slots are just 1x, pretty basic, and are normal PCI slots on the bottom. We can tell this is a more luxury board because we have all kinds of extra capacitors in the power delivery area for those overclocking needs. We have a very nicely thought out layout. We have a orange PCB, which is very pretty to look at, let me tell you that. We have IDE channels over here, channel one and two. We have four SATA ports. In this variety, there are already SATA version two, capable of running at three gigabits per second. We have three headers here for USB uh, header cards or connectors or whatever for your case. We have Firewire 1394 there. We have the front panel headers over here. We have a floppy header, auxiliary power for Molex for those really, really power hungry graphics cards of the day. I think this, at this point in time, the real top dogs were the 6800s, the 7800s, uh, along those lines on the GeForce side. And uh, I think they could be pretty, pretty powerful, but I wouldn't think they would be power hungry enough to necessitate that actual uh, auxiliary power there. So yeah, that's basically all we can see from the top side of this board. There's probably stuff that I'm missing here. Uh, this is just an overview. I haven't fully researched all the motherboards that we're taking a look at today. This is all from what I can see on the board and uh, yeah, what is in my memory on the back side let's try not to drop the board you can see it's nice nicely bowed but eh, no worries we have ps2 here this entire area is blank spdiff here eight channel audio firewire gigabit ethernet for usb 2.0 ports and that is it so no serial no parallel no vga so there's no onboard video on this board we'll have to think of something uh, that'll fit in one of these PCI Express or even PCI slots, assuming this board will still accept PCI as a graphics card. Right, so the socket is 939. This means that we have support for the Athlon 64, Sempron, 
Athlon 64FX and Athlon 64X2 CPUs. So, yeah. It's a bit of an upgrade from Socket 754. The main upgrade you get here is that you have dual core CPU support and you get dual channel memory rather than single channel memory. For our test setup, we will not be utilizing dual channel memory. We'll just be running a single stick. And this was the one that matches the color the closest that I could find. Here you can really tell this is bright red. This is nice orange. So, uh, yeah, you can put that in here like so. This board has more traditional memory slots than the chain tech that we took a look at in the previous video. We now also upgraded to DDR memory rather than SDR memory. So we're twice the data rates and then some. Uh, for a graphics card, they got this old thing. I believe it is a GeForce 7300LE. Came out of an HP low profile system. I know this car works, so we'll just use it for this. Funnily enough, I don't own a hell of a lot of PCI Express graphics cards from this era because I only have motherboards from this era that have AGP, so I never bother to collect older PCI Express cards. But again, if this board works, we might explore the SLI possibilities. I do have the original box of this board that also has an SLI bridge. And uh, yeah, we can see... Uh, what we can do there. In terms of uh, testing CPU, we have an Athlon 64 right here. It is the Athlon 64 3700 plus, pretty beefy single core CPU. We'll just need to figure out how to place it in the socket. Looking for the triangle from up here is actually more difficult than it looks like. All right, I think it's like this. Yep, slots right in. I think we'll also need a little bit of thermal compound, which is actually a shame because it's just going to be a test run. But I think we're going to need it. Alright, we have some deep cool thermal compound here. There we go, just a little P there in the middle. I'm not going to do P on the board, but we're going to use a P of thermal compound. Anyway, got our trusty AMD stock cooler over here. I've lost count of how many of these I actually have. Uh, let's see, we're going to use the clip to the bottom or the upper edge. I don't really care too much, to be honest. By the way, this retention mechanism is still in use today. That's just cool, isn't it? Okay. We've got one end locked in. Let's feel there. Yep, we got it in there. And now we just need to move this over and lock it into place. And I feel a lot of resistance, so I'm not entirely sure if this cooler will do for this test, but... I don't think it will actually latch on this. This might be a 754 cooler. I'm feeling just a little bit too much resistance there, but... All right, there we go. Just had to pull it back a little bit. It is now securely installed. We can use one of the many fan connectors on this motherboard. This time it's not sarcastic, because this board has more than is typical for this era. Well, we're not going to connect the... IDE yet, we just need to find out if it posts. This board, I mean this power supply does not have the 24 pin, that's not a problem for the test. Let's see the edges on this side, so we need to rotate it this way. And I immediately saw the PSU move and try to boot up. So let's turn that power supply off. I don't want to uh, fry this board. Let's remove this power connector for the SD or the CF adapter. We won't be needing that. What we will need is not a PCI Express connector either. We need the 12 volt auxiliary power supply. 
which is located over here. There we go. So that should work. Fan spins nice and freely. Don't see anything else that we need right now, except for our peripheral connectors. Gigabit Ethernet. Check. Mouse and keyboard. Very handy to have. And our VGA connector. Which I feel is pulling on this adapter here. So we'll screw that down. It's all firmly connected. All right, let's go ahead and uh, do our first boot try. All right, we're good to go. Luckily, we have silk screen labeling on the motherboard, so we can find out what the power button is. It should be these pins here after we turn the power supply on. There we go. And here we go. Wow, that's impressively quick. We have a post. CMOS checks some error. Yep, that makes sense. That CMOS battery is long dead. And that fan needs to be lubricated, but that's fine. Award BIOS version 6.00, okay. Our CPU is detected, Athlon 64, 3700 plus. BIOS date, 2006. All right, so far we've only tested the system with the Ward BIOS, I think. Here we can actually overclock the CPU. I do not intend to overclock this particular one, although it is one of the faster single core chips you can put on a board like this. Okay, it's 2006, well, I wish it was. Uh, let's change the boot up sequence. We'll need that later to get into an operating system and do some testing. We don't need to adjust the HT frequency. We don't need to disable the SSC instruction set. I have no reasons to do so. We have serial ATA and IDE controllers enabled and RAID is disabled. Uh, yeah, it actually supports RAID across IDE and serial ATA controllers, so that's nice. It means you can actually RAID some IDE hard drives on this, or SATA hard drives, or SATA SSDs, if it will support SSDs, but it's USB 2, uh, I mean SATA 2, so it should actually allow for SSDs to work properly. Got a couple we can try, so that'll be nice. Uh, let's see, here we have cool and quiet support. We'll leave that on auto. We can disable that. We have speed sensitive games, for instance. Uh, the first version of Unreal Tournament is actually really speed sensitive. If you have speed step or cool and quiet enabled, it will actually speed up and slow down. Here we can set a fan speed. Speed control 60%. Let me call it another 50, I guess. Shutdown temperature 75. That's actually quite a low. Well, I guess I should remember that AMD chips from this era were actually not that hot running in general and didn't have that high max temperatures. Um, I'm not actually too fussed about this. This cooler should be able to handle this chip, no problems. Uh, yeah, I guess the most interesting thing is actually this uh, this system here. I mean, I don't think we can up the multiplier because it's locked. We need to have a black edition CPU or something like that. I don't think they existed on this platform, so we can only do. FSB overclocking, for instance, we could set this to, I don't know, uh, 220. 
this would overclock the CPU generally so this should up the clock speed by 20 times 11 megahertz so we, go, we just go over 2.4 gigahertz but this will also up the speed of the memory which we don't want so we're going to leave that alone we might do that in the future, have some fun with uh, trying to overclock a CPU. And then do some SLI. -ing. Plenty of options there, okay. So we've set our preferences for now. Let's see if we can still get a post. Yep, goes straight through and tries to boot a device that doesn't exist. Okay, so... Let's get into a operating system and do some testing. Well, things kind of got out of hand. Uh, I guess you can tell by the massive piece of video card that's now there. Uh, yeah, I had an 8800 GT from a Mac Pro that uh, I repasted about a year ago and then just put into storage for, well, whatever reason. Just had it planned uh, to just stay in there and not be used for a while. So yeah, because of the uh, whole SLI shtick, uh, yeah, I decided to see if I could actually make it work on a PC. And as it turns out, there's no problem there. There are no limitations that uh, prov or prevent you from running an 8800 GT in a Mac and a PC at the same time with the same ROM. So yay so i ordered a secondary 8800 gt which will go here at some point in the future and then we can do some SLIing, which is very nice so yeah the card is working we also installed some extra memory we have two gigabytes installed we'll have to see if windows agrees with that statement first of all let's see if we can do something about the flickering won't set it down to 60 hertz there we go, that's much better. Ah, CRTs. I could have used an LCD, but I figured, well, we're testing retro motherboards. Why not use a CRT for the entire process? Also, I am lazy, and I did not want to haul it away and put an SSD or an LCD in its place. Right, so here we have Microsoft Windows XP, as we all know it. Let's uh, do a bit of the zoomies. There we go. Yep, that'll do. We have a 2.2 gigahertz Athlon 64 with 2 gigabytes of RAM. Alright, so I've installed CPU-Z so we can take a look at our specifications and it's absolutely freaking out now. I apologize for the flickering, there's not much I can do. Uh, let's zoom anywhere closer. As we can see, we have an Athlon 64, 3700 plus, San Diego, which means we have the full fat 1 megabyte of L2 cache, and a 2.2 gigahertz clock speed in case of this particular model. Our motherboard is, of course, an ABIT KN8 SLI, BIOS from 2006, full PCI Express speed there, 2 gigabytes of DDR in a dual channel a configuration, finally dual channel, very nice. Two, two sticks, one gigabyte each. And here we have our 512 meg NVIDIA GeForce 8800 GT. It is an actual original NVIDIA reference card. Right, so. There we go. Let's do a CPU bench here. Which nets us a 205 score. And there's nothing in here that will actually compare fairly. But, you know. It's uh, not even close, yep. <laughs> An i7 4558U, which is a 2-core, 4th threaded CPU, is just over 3 times as fast as a single-core Athlon 64. That actually shows you how good these Athlon 64s really were, because that CPU is like 10 years newer, and it has four times the threads. So, 
and a hurry clock speed as well. So that's fun. We like fun around here. Here we have the software that is called Everest, which is very nice. You can also do all of your hardware identification in here. So we can see that the CPU has a TDP of 89 watts. You can see all the instructions that it supports. Again, a bit K and 8. Special devices are the audio and gigabit LAN. Yep, audio is not working, but that's because that's very typical for motherboards from this era. If you don't connect the front panel audio, there is no sound coming from the back. So that's normal. Right, so two things that we're going to do to uh, test the hardware out some more. First of all, we're going to go with the classic tried and true Quake 3 Arena 32 bit 1024 768, all details maxed out. Now, what we're going to do is a time demo. There we go, 319 FPS. Let's run it again. Yep, 319 FPS again. All right. And last but not least, let's use Fraps here and go for the age old question. But can it run Crisis? All right, ring game. Again, this is 1024 by 768 with high settings. With a single 8800 GT. This water is translucent, isn't it pretty? Except for the fact that these textures aren't loading at all, but hey. It's just pre-release versions of software for it. this uh, loading issue let's actually try and save the game here there we go and then we'll load straight into it and maybe that'll make the textures work or perhaps this demo doesn't actually work with the full textures Oh, this is weird. Oh well. The water's pretty though. The frame rate is decent for what it is. Alright. So, we answered the question, can it run Crisis? Yes it can. In high settings even, 30 FPS. Now that was a surprise, wasn't it? So yeah, I think uh, we've uh, had enough fun with this board for today. It's working great. I'm definitely looking forward to experimenting some more with it and actually going to do uh, some SLI. And uh, yeah, that's something for a future video. Hope you enjoyed this one. I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.